Well, growing up as a kid, I was real, real, real skinny. If you saw me in swim trunks, you would have been able to count all of my rib bones. I was nothing but skin and bones. In fact, uh, my friend's uncle, who I grew up with, uh, used to nickname me Bones. And unfortunately, I was every bit as uncoordinated as I was skinny. So that same guy who called me Bones would also tell me, you couldn't hit a baseball with a barn door. So not surprisingly, I grew up insecure and very shy. When I got into high school and college, then I worked out in the weight room and tried to put some muscle on these bones. But if the truth be told, and when you grow older you realize this, if the truth be told, I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone because we all have our weaknesses, if we're honest about it. We all have our weaknesses. Some of us grow up with labels like ADD, attention deficit disorder, or we're considered autistic or something like that. We might be very good on the physical uh, athletic field, but not so good in the classroom. We might grow up emotionally weak and prone to depression. Or we may grow, grow up with very weak when it comes to certain temptations like alcohol or drugs or whatever. But my point is, we all have weaknesses if we swallow our pride in a minute. And we need to realize that weaknesses come in all forms, shapes, and sizes. If we're honest with ourselves, we will admit that. Now, some of our weaknesses are obvious to all, even if they're not obvious to us. We have other weaknesses that are only known by God and us, but they are there. For this reason, then, to varying degrees, we should all be able to relate to what Paul talks about today when he talks about weaknesses in 2 Corinthians. But this is our text. This is what I'm preaching on today. It's where Paul talks about weaknesses, and he says this. God tells him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul responds to what the Lord tells him, and he says this, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's kind of a paradox, right? Normally we would say, when I'm weak, then I'm weak, and when I'm strong, but I'm strong. We'll get into that today. Now, what the Lord told Paul, he tells us all. When the Lord tells Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, what applies to Paul applies to you and me. Whatever we are going through, God's grace is sufficient to get us through it. No matter what happens and what weaknesses and calamities and catastrophes and crosses come our way, God's grace is more than sufficient to help us deal with it. It may be a sickness, it may be a rejection, it may be persecution. It may be a problem with our finances, a problem at home, or a problem at work. But no matter what, God's grace is more than sufficient to help us to endure whatever cross or weakness we are facing. God's power, his grace, was more than powerful enough to deal with our sin. And so his grace is more than powerful enough to deal with our weaknesses. God's grace allows us to get in heaven, but God's grace also helps us to get through this life on earth, which is much harder. But notice what Paul says. Notice that Paul doesn't say God's power is made perfect in strength, but in weaknesses. See, the thing is, when we're on our own and we're trying to be self and independent, we think we're real strong, but in reality, we're very, very weak. Relying on ourselves doesn't make us strong. Relying on ourselves makes us weak. It is when we rely on God that we finally know what strength happens to be. Because who's stronger ultimately, God or us? God, obviously. So if we want to be strong, we've got to tap into him. And we tap into him when we are so weak, we have no choice but to tap in him. This is what the psalmist says. I love this psalm. It says, the Lord gives strength to his people. But you're not going to see that you need that strength until you see how weak you are. 
It is when we're weak that we rely on God, and so our weaknesses drive us to God, and that's what makes us truly strong. And notice, the psalmist doesn't say, the Lord gives weakness to his people. No, we're already weak, so we don't need weakness. We need the Lord's strength. And that's the thing. When our weaknesses make us rely on God, that's when we're strong. When we rely on ourselves, we are weak. And so the more our weaknesses make us more and more dependent upon God, then the stronger our faith becomes. My weakness is Parkinson's. And if God uses Parkinson's to make me rely on God more, then I can say with Paul, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So understand how all of this works. Paul goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now do we normally as human beings boast about our weaknesses? No, we hide our weaknesses. We don't want anybody to see our weaknesses. We are prone to boasting about our strengths. We want to put up a good strong front, a good false front, and look real strong. That's our human nature. And so we hide our weaknesses, but if there's an opportunity to talk about our strengths, then we swing the door wide open, and that's what we are tempted to boast about. Not our weaknesses, but our strengths. That's just the way we operate. That's our human nature. Paul, however, defies our human nature. He turns the whole thing upside down, or as some would say, upside right, because sin turned everything upside down. And so Paul is correcting everything, and he's turning it upside right. But Paul takes a different route. He goes a different way. And he boasts about what we are normally ashamed of, and he's ashamed of what we normally take pride in. He takes the focus off himself and puts the focus where it belongs, on God. By nature, as we all agree, we're tempted to brag and boast about what we do and do well. Whereas Paul boasts not about his strengths, but about his weaknesses. And we've already figured out why he does this. He knows that his weaknesses, whether it's persecution or poverty or whatever, that they serve a purpose. They serve to make him more dependent on God, and the more dependent on God he becomes, the stronger he becomes. And so in calamities and crosses and catastrophes, when he faces those things, those things make him cling tightly to God. That's what strengthens faith. For faith to grow strong, it must be tested. It must go through trials and tribulations. There is no other way. That's why I have a saying, faith is formed in the furnace of affliction. Faith is formed in the furnace of affliction. I have never known a Christian who had a strong faith who had an easy life. An easy life doesn't make for great faith. Adversity makes for great faith. <laughs> it's a lot like working out in a weight room, right? If you work real hard in a gym, you lift heavy weights and you work to exhaustion, you will actually leave that gym that day weaker than when you came in. That's the goal, is actually in your workout, you're progressively getting weaker and weaker because you're exhausting your muscles and you're exhausting your energy and your strength. But that isn't what makes you stronger. What makes you stronger actually happens after the workout and basically your body concludes, well, we're going through the stress, we're not measuring up, so we need to build up stronger muscles and bigger muscles. This is called what? Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is the exact opposite of atrophy. What's atrophy? When you get weaker and smaller. Hypertrophy is when you get stronger and bigger. But hypertrophy only happens when you go through hurt, physical pain. You've got to give your body the incentive to get bigger and stronger. So physical stress, not laziness, is what makes us stronger. No one has ever become strong by being lazy and lukewarm and li living a sedentary lifestyle. No, it t takes activity to get better. And this is why the athletes will have a saying, no pain, no gain. When we talk about pain, we're not talking about breaking our arms or hurting our joints. We're talking about the pain that is a result of a physical, vigorous physical exercise. When you exhaust the muscle, eventually it gets to the point 
that your body starts producing something called lactic acid. And it is that lactic acid that burns in the belly of the muscle. That's the pain we're talking about here. And so once an athlete understands how this works, then the athlete intentionally tries to get into that pain zone to feel that burning sensation of the lactic acid. And they even learn to celebrate it and pursue it because they know that's what they got to go through to become stronger and better. Well, Paul learned a very similar lesson in life. He learned that all the crosses he carried, all the calamities that Christ carried him through, all the catastrophes he went through served to strengthen his faith. Initially, like in a gym, these things warm out emotionally and physically, but eventually it made him more dependent upon God, and that's how he became stronger. It forced him, because he had no other choice, but to put his faith in God. Now Paul tells us about a time where this really happened. Like our text from 2 Corinthians today, this comes from 2 Corinthians, but from the first chapter. And this is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. You know, a lot of times people ask, why do we suffer? Here's one of the answers that God gives, but it goes like this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. He was at his rope, at the end of the rope. So that we despair even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. So he went through some incredible adversity in, in the con, uh, area of Asia. But then he explains why this happened. This is one of the reasons why we suffer. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So Paul knew why he suffered in Asia. He knew the reason for his suffering, to teach him a lesson, to rely on God and not on himself. And so trials and tribulation toughen our faith, not a life of luxury and laziness. Now Paul preaches pretty much the same thing in Romans chapter 5, but in chapter 5 he applies this all to us. In Romans chapter 5 he tells us that we rejoice in our sufferings. Let me repeat that. We rejoice in our sufferings. What do we normally do when we suffer? We whine and complain and feel sorry for ourselves, but that's not what Paul says we're supposed to do. We rejoice in our sufferings, and here he tells us why. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Tough times build character. Tough times build character. You know, in my last church, as in this church, I worked with a lot of older people who survived the Great Depression. And the Great Depression develop character in these people. We could learn a lot from our grandparents. Amen. They did not live outside of their means. I was saying you can't live a Cadillac lifestyle with a Chevy budget. You just can't. But we have a culture that does that, that's living way beyond their means. And so the thing I learned about that depression generation was they were very thankful for what they had and they were content with what they had. One of my members, um, his wife is still alive. She sends us birthday cards regularly from my last church. But her husband, I used to nickname Harry Hallelujah. He's what you call Luther Costal. Um, he loved to worship the Lord, uh, but he loved our church, and he's now in heaven. But anyhow, his kids always try to tell him, well, you got to move out, move farther out there, farther out there. And they're like, it's just the two of us and the dog. We don't need a bigger house than our ranch house. And that's the way they were. They were thankful what they had and content with what they had. Adversity builds character. Easy times spoil us. Now, if you know the Bible well, you know that at times, James and Paul didn't always see eye to eye. There was some conflict there. But on this topic, they totally, completely agree. What James writes in his first chapter sounds just like Paul in Romans chapter 5. And this is what Paul says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Again, repeat that. Consider it joyful, my brothers, whenever you go through trials. Again, our human nature is to whine, fuss, and complain, and wallow in self-pity. 
Paul and James say, no, you should rejoice during those times because God uses those times for his divine purposes. A lot of times we're just thinking about getting through the day and what's for lunch and dinner. That's not God's itinerary. As Luther says, we should all be like little Christ. That's God's goal for your life, to make you little Christ, to have you imitate him. So Peter and Paul agree on this. Painful times produce positive results. Painful times produce perseverance. Painful times creates character and help us to hope like we've never hoped before. Now Peter, not to be outdone, he says the same thing as James does and Paul does. Peter's version shows up in his first chapter where Peter writes, In this you greatly rejoice, Though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. An untested faith really is no faith at all. Tested faith is genuine faith. Well, all three of these men practice what they preached. They rejoice in their suffering. They considered it pure joy when they went through trials and they, whenever they suffered griefs. They practiced what they preached right up until the end. Think about it. The apostle Paul was beheaded. James was stoned and beaten to death by a, a washing implement. And then finally Peter was crucified upside down. How did they endure all that persecution? How did they endure that rejection from their fellow Israelites? How did they keep their faith right up until their martyrdom? It's because they knew that what they were going through served a purpose. They were never ever to suffer in vain. There were martyrs in the early church who were martyred joyfully with a smile on their face. face because they knew what was in the end. So think about all that Christ went through for us in our salvation. Because there is no greater proof of God's ability to bring good out of our suffering, to bring good out of bad, to bring good out of justice. There's no greater proof of that than the cross. God has this incredible ability to take our trials and our tribulations and our times of testing and turning them into the good. Think about all the misfortune Jesus faced and God took all of it and brought good out of it. Jesus sacrificed, through his sacrifice, we are saved. Through his suffering, we won't have to suffer hell forever. Through his death, he delivered us from death. Through his victimization, he became our victor. Through the injustice he endured, he justifies those of us who deserve nothing but God's punishment. He uses the only sinless man in history to save you and me. So all the bad that happened to Jesus, none of it which he uh, deserved, God took all of that and brought us and our salvation out from it. And for you and me, there's no greater good than that. And so when we take these truths to heart, whatever we have to endure in life, whatever it is, a cross we have to bear in our family, junk we have to deal with at work, whatever, when we look at it from Paul's perspective, we learn to rejoice in our suffering. We count it pure joy whenever we go through trials. We rejoice because we know the testing of our faith must happen to prove our faith is genuine. And that's why you and I can say with St. Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong. 